Good morning and welcome to St. James United Methodist Church Snow Day Edition. My name is Pastor Annie Baker Streavy, and it is a blessing to welcome you to worship in this new year. We are in the midst of starting a new worship series on the Lord's Prayer, uh, which is based on this book written by Adam Hamilton. And we are doing a book study that we'd love to invite you to, to get a deeper look um, into what we're going to talk about a little bit throughout this series in worship that's going to be on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And you are more than welcome to join us. Just email me or the office uh, and we can get you all set up for that with the Zoom link. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we often pray it by heart. We pray it often, we pray it in different times and in different settings. We remember it as the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. But do we really understand and appreciate the meaning and power of his words, of what we ask of God each time we pray it? When the disciples asked Jesus how to pray, Jesus gave them this prayer. He likely taught it to his followers often, not just one time. He never intended the Lord's Prayer to be a museum piece framed and placed on a mantle or in a display case. It was Jesus teaching God's people through his disciples how to pray. This week we are focusing on the first line of the prayer and we invite you to consider how you hollow or honor God's name through your own lives. In the next six weeks, we will be hitting each one of the following lines of the Lord's Prayer as we take a deeper look of how we can make that prayer come to life in a new way. As we begin to worship God this morning, let us pray together. Holy and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, even as we are at home dealing with this snow. And we just ask that you help everyone stay safe and warm. We especially think of those who are unhoused um, and who are living in the midst of poverty for whom this storm is that much worse. God, as we prepare to worship you this day, fill our hearts with your love and help us to feel your spirit even though we are dispersed this morning. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning, and that we'll be using repeatedly throughout this worship series, comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Jesus says, Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Also do not bring us into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So as I shared at the beginning of this video, we are embarking on a journey with the Lord's Prayer that will take us um, up to the season of Lent. We came up with this idea, and if you've read our newsletter, you've heard this story, but we came up with this idea thanks to our Sunday school class, actually, uh, with children, because we pray the Lord's Prayer as part of our communion liturgy, which the children participate in on Communion Sunday. And our Sunday school teacher, Robin, noticed that only one of the children really seemed to know the words to this prayer and participate with the rest of the congregation as we prayed this prayer. And so she thought it might be a good idea to um, teach the children as part of Sunday school the Lord's Prayer. So she purchased a 
beautiful children's book actually written by Reverend Adam Hamilton, um, who is the author of this series about the Lord's Prayer and was planning to gift the books to the children and teach them the Lord's Prayer. And when she told me this story, I said, I'm pretty sure that Adam Hamilton has an adult version of that book. And let's do it as a whole church thing where we are learning intergenerationally together about the Lord's Prayer. And so that's what we're doing. Here we are. I want you to now imagine yourself maybe in Sunday school like our children or maybe um, as an adult. Um, but imagine yourself go back to the time when you first heard or learned the Lord's Prayer. Who taught it to you? Where did you first hear it? Where were you? Were you in your church that you grew up in? Were you at church with a friend or a family member? How old were you when you first heard or learned the Lord's Prayer? If it was a long time ago, or maybe perhaps just you can't even think when you first learned it, you've just kind of always knew it um, because it was always just something you did. Maybe you never actually learned or understood what it meant. Or maybe you did, but now you're in a new season of life and it means something different for you now. My hope is that through this series, we can all unpack together the Lord's Prayer and what those words we say actually mean as we go throughout this series over the next six weeks. Recently, I was reading um, a book by one of my favorite authors that I haven't read since maybe high school, college, uh, Jane Austen. I'm a huge Jane Austen fan. And I joined a book club um, locally. And the first book we're reading is Persuasion by Jane Austen. And so I started reading it over my vacation and I was having a really hard time with it. I knew the words, I could read it, but it was written in such a different language than I speak every day or hear every day that I was having a hard time grasping what it meant as a whole. But the more that I read it and got into it, I finally found myself in a rhythm where the words became familiar, the phrasing of the sentences became familiar, and it started to make more sense. And then next week, I'll be going to the book club where we'll discuss this book in community and therefore be able to learn even more about what I was reading. I'm hoping that's the same as we unpack the Lord's Prayer together in community, that these familiar words that don't quite make sense start to develop more understanding of what it actually means when we pray it as we unpack it together in our faith community. This week, we are focusing on the line from the Lord's Prayer right at the beginning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Lord's Prayer is found in scripture in the books of Matthew and of Luke. We are using it from the book of Matthew for this series, but they're very similar. And it was taught to the disciples by Jesus as part of his Sermon on the Mount. Jesus prayed throughout the stories we read in the Gospels, of course, but this prayer in particular is the only one where Jesus is actually teaching others what words to say and how to pray. As we embark on this series, I also want to invite you into this prayer and learn to learn it and to spend time with it daily, to pray it every day so that we can come to learn it together um, and relearn it. So let's start by just breaking even this first line down even smaller. So it begins with our Father. Now, as many of you know, God has many names throughout scripture. Yahweh, El Shaddai, Elohim, Lord, on and on and on. But this one, Father, is the one that Jesus uses the most. 
And the author of this book series um, suggests that there might be two reasons for that. The first is the word father itself notes a particular kind of relationship. It's one that is intimate and caring. Now, many of some of you, I myself, have issues with only seeing God as father. It puts God in a particular box and a particular understanding. This can also be especially challenging for folks that did not have great relationships with their own father um, or folks that experienced trauma um, by their father. And so sometimes when we pray our father, it can feel off or distant from us because of our own experience of what a father is. But the author Adam Hamilton invites us to kind of flip this idea on its head. He says to think about how God is not our father in the way that earthly fathers who are human are fathers, but instead earthly human fathers should be trying to be a father the way God is a father. He writes this, God is the pattern and example of what a father is meant to be. That is one who is steadfast, faithful, loving, kind, compassionate, merciful, and present. In this, the words of Jesus are instructive. Now, if that image of God as father is still not helpful for you because you can't relate to it or because of trauma, it is totally okay to call some God something else, to use a different image or name or word f for God. Because, of course, all these words that we use for, for God are human constructed and they're often metaphors, which always fall short of the fullness of who God is. And when we use these words and names, we're just trying to do our best to understand God, which we'll always never have a total understanding for. Also, God, God's self, is beyond gender because gender is a human and social construct. So in the Bible, we even see that there are many different gendered names for God. There's images of a mother hen God. Um, there are images of Sophia, of the Holy Spirit as the divine feminine, um, and on and on and on. God is so beyond our human understanding, and we can only do our best to name God. The other important part of this first part of our prayer, our Father, is the our part. Notice that Jesus, when he teaches his disciples and us to pray, doesn't say my father who are in heaven, but instead says our father who are in heaven. This reminds us that God is the father or parent of us all. It shifts us from a me, me, me focus to a we focus. So it makes us think of others. It makes us think of our shared humanity. I remember when I traveled to the Holy Land in 2018 with um, our Bishop Devadar, who recently passed this last year, he, every place we went, we prayed the Lord's Prayer. And one of the reasons for that, specifically in the Holy Land, which was a land for many faiths, especially in the Abrahamic tradition, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, the bishop felt that this prayer in particular was universal especially among those faiths. It was inclusive um, of those religions because it didn't specifically name Jesus the Christ. It named our Father, our God, um, and therefore could be used by anyone. Adam Hamilton writes that this prayer reminds us that our faith, because of the we, our focus, is intended to be lived out with others and that our prayers are prayed with others and for others, not just ourselves. He continues saying, to acknowledge God as our common father is to recognize our obligation to our neighbors, all of whom are made in the likeness and image of God. 
The next part of this first line of prayer is our Father who art in heaven. In his book, Adam Hamilton talks about asking a child, where, where is God? <laughs> where is God located? Or receiving that question from a child, where, where does God live? I remember when my own child, who is now four, first asked me that about God, where, where is God? Where does God live? And I think, thinking quick on my feet, the best way I could answer that was, oh, God lives in your heart. Well, while true, that is hard for children who are literal. Um, Finn was worried about all the blood and guts in there that God would have to work around to make a house in there. And was God really that small? And also this image of God being in our heart came back to bite me this past Christmas when Finn asked for a very elaborate Christmas gift. And I told him, mm, I'm not sure Santa or me will be able to get that for you. And he said, well, you know how God is in my heart? Well, God in my heart said that Santa was going to get me that present. So that's what it is. I love the childlike <laughs> questions that kids bring to faith because I think deep down, grownups have those questions too. Where is God? According to our prayer, God dwells in heaven. And according to the scriptural understanding of heaven or heavens, whichever word is used in the original biblical language, this means that God is everywhere. God is all around us. God is not just in the distinctive place of earth or the distinctive place of sky, but in the heavens, in the spaces between, in the sky, in the earth, among us, in the air we breathe and beyond. Heaven is also understood to be a state of being in scripture. It's another word we use for the kingdom of God. It is a state of being where everyone is loved and cared for and in the presence of God. And finally, the last part of this section, this just first line of our prayer, we've already learned so much about this prayer that we pray. The last part we're gonna talk about today is hallowed be thy name. Now, hallow is not often used in our language today, unless maybe you're reading a Jane Austen novel like I am. But hallow, we hear sometimes the time of Halloween. Um, and hallow means uh, holy. It's another word to be made holy or to be made sacred. But God is already holy. So why are we asking God to be made holy? The way this prayer is meant to be prayed, hallowed be thy name, is the first thing we're asking God to do in this prayer. It's our first request for God's name to be made holy, to be made sacred or honored or glorified. But how is God's name hallowed? How do we do that? By the way we, as people of God, as God's children, live our lives. Adam Hamilton writes, we hallow God's name by living in a way that reflects God's goodness, majesty, beauty, and love. So some examples of how we can do that. Being kind to someone, helping, serving, um, refraining from being a jerk in traffic, letting someone go in front of you in a line at the grocery store, living a life that embodies God's love living by the golden rule. Love God and love others as you love yourself. Unfortunately, many Christians are not very good at hallowing God's name. And it's why many people are turned off from Christianity and the church itself. I mean, can you blame them? <laughs> Think of all the horrible things that have been done in God's name. In the past, the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, wars have been fought to hallow God's name. Violence has been done 
in God's name, harm has been done and continues to be done in God's name. This Christmas, uh, Pope Francis actually addressed this issue in his yearly uh, Christmas Day Mass. He called for peace around the world, and he specifically mentioned the appalling ways the weapons industry has grown and supported violence and wars all around the world. Pope Francis called out the United States in particular, as well as other countries, for making the very bombs that were killing thousands of people, children, babies in Gaza, or for also using the war in Ukraine just to test out weapons for mass production and destruction. Pope Francis said this, It should be talked about and written about so as to bring light the interests and the profits that move the puppet strings of war. And how can we even speak of peace when arms production, sales, and trade are on the rise? Friends, we are not innocent bystanders in this. While we may not personally assemble the weapons that are hurting, killing other people. We do live in a world that is run by capitalism that fuels money into the weapons industry. We also vote for government officials who okay for weapons to be made. And we financially support companies or organizations that make weapons themselves, or at the very least, we have stocks or invest in companies that do so. So how is that hallowing God's name? It's not. Over the next six weeks, as we continue to really understand the words we are saying and praying when we pray Jesus's prayer, the Lord's prayer, I want to invite you to take a risk and go beyond just saying the words by heart. I want you to remember that prayer itself is meant to be lived out. It's not just passive words, thoughts and prayers that we say, but it's prayer and work, the actions that we do to make those prayers a reality in conjunction with God. When you pray, our father or our parent or our God, mother of us all. Remember that this prayer goes beyond just you and that God cares for all of us intimately like a father should. When you pray who are in heaven, remember that God is all around us and in the very air we breathe. When you pray, hallowed be thy name, Remember that you, as a Christian, are called to live your life in a way that brings honor and holiness to God's very name. After all, this whole thing we're doing called Christianity, called faith, called church, it isn't just something we passively attend, or at least it shouldn't be. Instead, it is a way of living our lives every moment of every day with intentionality, with integrity, with honor, with authenticity, and of course, with love. May it be so. Amen. And now I want to invite you to pray the Lord's Prayer with me now. Let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Although we're not together in person this week, I do want to invite you to continue being in prayer for our community and those um, that we care for and those who we don't even know their names, but who God knows. So please be in prayer. Uh, Make sure you are part of our uh, email prayer chain so you can get the prayers that people are requesting so you can be part of that. That is one way that you can give to the community and congregation of St. James is by being in prayer with us. Another way that you can support our ministry is, of course, financially. And even though it was a snow day this week, we would encourage you to not miss the opportunity to give to the wonderful things God is doing in our midst. You can give online on our website through a secure PayPal site, or you can bring your offering in person or mail it in um, the next time that you see us. As always, we thank you so much for your gifts, financial, your gifts of prayer, your gifts of presence and service and time, because the church wouldn't be the church without the body of Christ, who is you. Friends, I am so sad we didn't get to see each other today, but I look forward to seeing you in person next week or online if you always watch online. We're so glad to have you. And I offer you this final blessing as you finish uh, this video and go into the rest of your day. Hear this blessing. May the God who is God and father and parent and mother and caregiver to us all. Be with you this day and every day. May you remember that God dwells in heaven, which is all around us. And may you go to hallow God's name, to live a life that is holy and loving. May God go with you to empower you to do the work that you are called to do. In Jesus' name, amen.